24th of May. How are you now? Still just trying to collect ourselves after that wild weekend of uh, extraordinary weather that roared through the province right from, holy cow, Detroit all the way out to parts of Quebec. Uh, We lived through it. We personally, our family lived through it on Saturday. And we had property damage. We had good news, no damage done to the house. But I'm telling you, if you are anywhere in that sort of Kawartha's area, similar to the Ottawa region, you're not getting power back probably until maybe close to Election Day, which is June the 2nd. Dave Trafford here. It's the Rit Race. It's the daily version of On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast. And I, you know, I, I, my head just about spun off my shoulders when I heard commentators saying, you can't politicize this storm. You can't politicize an emergency. Well, you kind of can. We did it all the way through COVID to somehow suggest that Stephen Del Duca was in the wrong for saying, um, hello, over here, there's a problem going on that we need to be paying attention to. Where is the premier? And then he's in Del Duca getting grief because he's somehow politicizing this tragedy for a lot of people. Ten people were killed in the storm. So it wasn't anything insignificant. Now... Yeah, you know, take it as you will. But I was on social media on the weekend saying, okay, you know, somebody said he's just trying to get out there in front of the cameras and make something out of it. You realize that the media has been completely anemic in its coverage of what's going on in Ontario as far as the storm's concerned. Whether it's people who are living not with just without power, but without gasoline, but without water, clean water. I mean, this is a problem that needs attention. And I can tell you firsthand, we saw it happen in the Peterborough region over the weekend when we were at the family cottage. We were lucky enough to be able to drive away from it, come back to Toronto, the cozy 416-905. Yeah, there are some trees down in High Park. Power's back on. But there's not a lot of attention being paid to those areas. Del Duca even goes to Ottawa, because I expect he thinks that that's you know, vote rich for him. But if he hadn't done that, to what extent would the media have paid any attention to what was going on on an individual basis? I'm ranting. I want to include the co-hosts here. Keith Leslie is here. You hear and see him on CH Television. And John Wright from Maru Public Opinion. Um, You know, again, I rant off the top on this. But if that is not what qualifies to me, Keith, as... At, at least an utterance of a state of emergency when we have seen so many other things happen. This reflected on, to me, uh, back to, you know, 2003, August, big blackout. There are people living in those circumstances now that we saw back in 03, back on the, in the ice storms of, in Ottawa. And we're not considering it or we don't even treat it with any sense of urgency. I don't get it. I, I don't either. I mean, when Ottawa Hydro uh, posted online that the damage for that system is worse than it was in the ice storm, that really put it into perspective. That means it's going to be days, maybe even weeks, before some people get power. And in certain areas, uh, Pine Glen, south of Maryville and uh, Hunt Club area, they're on, they're on uh, you know, the well yeah. water. So if they don't have power, they don't have water. And this, you know, Del Duca's only mistake in this, in, in trying to, you know, Politicize. He's not trying to politicize. He went to the site, you know, where the worst damage is. Uh, he said he was suspending his campaign and then yeah. held a news conference there to talk about it. Well, that's not suspending exactly. your campaign. He certainly altered his itinerary. Yeah. He, he abandoned plans. I think he was going to Niagara to go out there. That's a smart thing to do and to call out Doug Ford on it. And that's the real issue, wasn't it? Where is Premier Ford? I mean, this damage was substantial. Uh, in a huge swath of the province, it's going to continue as we, you know, the the the, the, the repairs that are going to be necessary for hydro. Are going to, you know, where's the the stories about the hydro crews rushing in from New York State, rushing in from elsewhere to, to, to help us with this? Where's the call for this kind of stuff? Where was Doug Ford? Well, Doug Ford on holiday Monday put out a news release saying he was going to have a campaign stop in Etobicoke in his own riding, 
And so CBC, which happened to be the pool camera for the day, uh, called up and said, well, where is this? Look, where, where is it? You know, we, we went, oh, well, the media aren't invited to the campaign. But it was event. a media advisory, I should point out. But it was a media <laughs> advisory, but the media aren't invited. So then uh, when Del Duca did his news conference, clearly the Ford campaign said, we better put the premier out. He better say something. So they immediately sent him out, I think it was to mm-hmm. Uxbridge. Uh, which is somehow near Cottage Country. Anyway, uh, he managed to get to Oxbridge, and they actually uh, gave a 30-minute notice. So uh, Sean O'Shea from Global Television got there and started asking the Premier questions. Clearly, they did not want questions to be asked. Uh, and, 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 you know, he was just, Ford just got immediately testy about it. And he was, uh, you know, who are you with Global? Well, you know where I've been, you know, this sort of thing. And again, this morning, Ford held a news conference up in Brampton, and the first questions to talk about high, or uh, excuse me, to talk about you know his plans to build uh, uh, highways and to build transit and everything else and any very election stuff. But the first question was about following this storm. Uh, your plans on climate change and to deal with more severe storms like this seem to be you know weak. Uh, and Ford said, well, you know, I, I disagree completely with your question, but thank you very much for that question. And he just got really testing his response and boasted about how much they've done and where their plans are. But the response was not at all. I mean, he, where was the empathy? Where was the, 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 the you know, I, I, what I saw yesterday was shocking, and I didn't even see the worst of it because I wasn't out in Ottawa where right now it appears to be they're going to be, you know, days and days before they get power back. And the, 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 the number of hydro lines that are down is shocking, and it's going to take huge repairs. Where was he on this? Where was the sense of urgency from the Premier? Especially, you would think, given the criticism he took over the, I'm going to use the word, occupation of Ottawa, when when the protest convoy was in there. Again, Ford was virtually absent for that entire time. He had to be chased down to be asked questions in response to the government. So you would think he would be a bit sensitive to Ottawa's particular needs politically in the middle of an election campaign when a natural disaster like this occurs. And he seemed to be just completely tone deaf about it. And the one reporter with the camera that shows up, he gets into a fight with him. And at the end, when O'Shea keeps asking, and he went off. He wasn't asking just about the storm. He started asking about those PC invoices that they sent out as a fundraiser last year. That clearly had the premier upset. The OPP bodyguards step in and push Sean out of the way. What the heck is that? I've never seen the police do that. So what if Ford doesn't want to answer questions? And what if the, the, the campaign doesn't want him facing them from the media? It's not the police's job to get involved in that at all. And it just looked like they were annoyed and gave Sean a little shove. Totally unnecessary. And if you, if you l- watch that and listen to the tone that Sean uses, and we know Sean well, very well, he uh, was entirely respectful. He's pushing the point, but entirely respectful. So let me ask you, John, is this the act of God that sort of takes the sleepwalk campaign off of its track? I, I, does it have any effect? Because all of a sudden, you know, to hear criticism that he's trying to have a bubbled campaign is one thing. But to stay in the bubble while hell's breaking loose and people lost their lives. They, there just seems to be this level of ignorance and real tone deafness about this. We can't hear you. You're muted. I don't think it's had an effect at all, and I don't think it will. Let me tell you a quick story. One of the first things that I ever did in the polling business was uh, there was an outbreak of something in a long-term care home in the Hamilton region, and it killed a bunch of people. It was a private sector-owned company. It was uh, it was profiled by the Hamilton spec, and then it bled into the Toronto Star. It was a big headline story, and it ran for two or three days. And I got a phone call, and they said, you know, can you do some polling? We're really scared that it's, you know, damaged our brand. So I I went and did the poll, and I came back to the board of directors within about four days. Big sample size in Toronto and and there and in Hamilton, and here was the bottom line. Uh, Almost everybody in both of those places had heard of this unfortunate circumstance. It was really, really bad. But no one could recall the specific name of the long-term care ownership. Not a, like It was like 0%. And I just said to them, you know, it's a hit and run, but nobody got the license plate. So, you know, you've, you've got a situation here where Ottawa doesn't have any power. No one's listening to the radio. No one listens to television. No one knows that the premier is somewhere else. I mean, they're still getting this stuff Today, there's still areas which don't have it. I saw the Toronto Star today. It's got a photograph of the Premier walking in Uxbridge, and it looks like he's, you know, 
you know, in a war zone, and that's that's fine. Most people on that afternoon were were recovering from the storm itself and probably just getting on with the rest of their holiday weekend in less hit areas. So, I, I mean, I take that all in stride in that not a lot of people knew where the premier was that day, nor Mr. Del Duca. Number two is that <clears throat> Jim Watson issued a call to arms in Ottawa, and the premier did issue some, you know, condolences and some concerns for the region. But I, I don't, I don't think anybody was distracted by his not being on top of this. And while we can all kind of circle the drain and sort of say he's he's been out of action and it's not a place for the premier, your question was, does this have any impact on the campaign? Has it derailed or gone anywhere else? The answer is no. I mean, you can you can evidence that by this morning, where we're now talking more about Dan Arnold's poll. It's being you know leaked to Rob Benzi and. You've got, for some strange reason, Andrew Horvath in Pickering. I don't get that one. But, you know, we're, we're back on the campaign trail. So, I, yes, he probably could have done more, but I don't think this has affected the Premier very much. I, I think a lot of people saw a lot of stuff that happened but didn't get the license plate number. Well, in his defense as well, he did, the campaign was smart enough to have him phone into the Bill Carroll show in Ottawa. Sure. Uh, yesterday morning, so he wasn't available. So he did, you know, if people in Ottawa, they were probably listening to the radio as opposed to watching TV. If they had any media at all to listen in, that was, again, the premier was seemingly the, at least aware of what was going on and talking to an Ottawa radio host about it. Yeah, I, I guess the, um, you know, once you get to the end of this week and there are still people without gas and without water and without power, uh, this is going to linger. So I, I, I can't, and we are going to get fed up with it in a hurry, particularly because, as I said, back in the cozy 416905 area, everything seems to be, you know, back to normal with the exception of some spots like Uxbridge. It, it, would, it would appear that politically they're only willing to focus on what we have said all along is that 905 ring around around Toronto. Yeah, but I don't think you're going to have, uh, you know, a big blowback on the province because hydro can't get stuff up in the north. I mean, it, hydro's doing what they do. I did see some prominent people, actually prominent people in Toronto who issued some statements on in a couple of places after 48 hours that they didn't have power on and how, you know, terrible this was and people just beat them down you know my god you know what third world do you live in you know and 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 so there's a sense that when the mayor of ottawa and a bunch of other people and hydro spokespeople say this is the worst that it's been if you combine the ice storm and the, the last time they had this sort of thing together i mean you might as well go back to the days of the blackout that we had right mm -hmm. like, it, yeah it's tough but even when you look at where hydro has made the reparations this morning um, to this circumstance, it's, it covers almost, you know, 90% of Ontario where they've done the job and now they're down to a few pockets. So I just don't think it's going to have that much of an impact. I think we're, we're headed over the next week. We'll get, we had some, we had a poll out on the, uh, on, I think it was Monday by uh, Abacus that said basically no real change. Um, and we're going to get a few polls by the end of this week, but I can't think of anything I mean, if this is the most excitement of the entire campaign, it speaks to how the conservatives are going to get a majority. I mean, that's it. Let me talk about the, the, the polling because, you know, in the last episode we touched on where it was going and how it reflected seat projections and how fluid a lot of that was. And, and I think, if nothing else, indicated how tight some of these local riding races are going to be, particularly vis-a-vis -vis NDP and the Liberals. You already referenced the piece that... Um, Rob Benzie published this morning in the Star, John, and he's talking about this internal polling that suggests, you know, if, they, if the Liberals keep working hard, they're going to hold the uh, Tories to uh, a minority. Uh, but in the same edition, you've got another story that says, um, you know, the NDP are gaining at the expense of the Liberals. Um, so, and then we just on the weekend had the, you know, the, the signal stories that we're going to have um, the Liberals outdistance the NDP in popular vote but lose seats. Holy cow. <laughs> two, yeah, but two two words sum it all up. Rob Benzie got a poll, internal poll. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's from Dan Arnold. That's a leak. That's a deliberate strategic leak because they're going down in flames in a bunch of ridings and they decided to boost, you know, the local band to say, hey, we got a chance at this sort of thing and to get another headline saying at least there's a momentum for the Liberals, but they – NDP, you know, that's the cheese that slid off the cracker. 
I, I mean, there's, there's, you know, I did an interview with um, a radio station the other day, and um, and they asked me some questions about, you know, what this looked like, and you know whether there was a chance that there'd be a major change in the campaign. I said, no, I don't think so at all. And they said, well, when was the last time you saw something like this? Can we, can we put all things to bed and say that it's all over? I said, well, you never say never. Well, of course, I'm going to say that. Um, and I have seen it where there has been a last minute come from behind. And I referenced 1990 with Bob Ray, stuff like that. So what's the headline? It goes out on on um, on on Twitter and it's kind of like John Wright says it's not over yet. You know, and it's like, OK. All right. So what we're doing is we're manufacturing clickbait because, you know, some people, you know, and I look at it and say, oh, my God, you know, what am I going to be known for, you know, after that fact? And then I watch the clip, which was also taped. And it's kind of like it's got the whole thing, but somebody wrote the headline and it, you know, there you go. I, I Look, I, I don't think much has changed since the outset of this campaign. If you look at where the conservatives are in the aggregate and in most of the specific polls done by the independents, they're, they're running around 36 to 38 percent in that range. That's where they've been at the lowest point, 35 the Liberals have been stuck at around 28, and Andrew Horvath and the NDP have been stuck at 24. Okay, within the variation in the entire campaign, nothing has really changed. And so you, you look at it and say, well, are, will there be close writings? The answer is yes. I mean, it'll be interesting to watch. I don't know what St. Paul's is going to be like, but that's, you know, Jill Andrews is the NDP, and I don't know whether – it doesn't seem like Stahl has, you know, taken a lot of – the, the new doctor they're running here, they only run, the liberals only run doctors here. It doesn't seem like it's it's taken hold. But yeah, there's going to be some margin here or there. But I think you have to go back to the main part, Dave. And that is, I, I you have to throw a government out. There still isn't an, uh, an, uh, an appetite for that. It's, it's 15 points, 10 to 15 points less than it was the last time. Secondly, I did go out to the advanced polls on the weekend, a Victoria Day weekend. And, and it's unlike the last time I went out to an advanced poll where it was packed and people were getting in to line up to throw the bums out or to make a serious statement, even during the federal campaign, right? Oh, my God, just walk into the church. It's a transfiguration, and it's like you've gone to church. I mean, no one's around. There's a couple of people in the pews. You know, there's incense burning. You know, and people are very polite. You're in and out in 30 seconds. Bob's your uncle. Okay, there you go. And, and so I, I think at the end of the day, whether you're Nick Kuvalis or whether you're Don, Dan Arnold or somebody else, they're looking at polls which effectively are the same. I mean, Nick's may even be a little bit higher. But the reality is we're going to end up with a majority government, probably 73 to 80 seats in that range. Is it over? Well, it certainly is not for the NDP. I'm going to tell you, I mean, I have my eye on them to see how low the limbo is and whether or not it, it drops, you know, in certain ridings. And that's why I've got my eye more on the, the stall versus Jill Andrews kind of thing here in Toronto, but for, for the province wide, I, I just, I think that they've got to get their vote out, but the efficiency of the conservative vote, the older taxpayer people who are more motivated as conservatives to get out, that even gives them a more opportunity at the, at, at the, um, at the ballot box, along with all those union led houses of which many of them are on strike right now. And many of them still want the, you know, the highways and the construction to take place. So he's got a lot going in his favor that he didn't have last time. So, Keith, is this the liberal version, this is the Del Duca version of Kathleen Wynne saying, we admit we're not going to win, but if you want to beat, uh, keep Ford down, you got to vote for us instead of the NDP. It sounds that that's the script, wasn't it? And re- re- it's almost that, that but, but, but Wynne was far more blatant. I'm going to lose. People hate me. Yeah. <laughs> people really, really hate she's me. She's self-aware. Uh, uh, she's very self-aware. She was very self-aware. Kathleen yeah, yeah. Wynne was always very and, – and, you know, she told it straight up, too. But it, it really hurt the New Democrats. They were really close uh, to being challenging, and, and that really hurt the New Democrats in the last weeks. Yeah, I don't know if this is Del Duca's version because it's been his version of it all along, as it has been Horvath's. You know, Horvath's version was uh, we were only 10 seats away from uh, forming a government. You know, it, well, of course you were because the liberal vote totally collapsed. So they're both trying to make that case. I think the one thing that John touched on in, in the polls, and this is the one that I always, always watch, uh, is the time for change. And that, surprisingly, in the latest ones, appears to be down below 50%, finally. It's like at 48%. Correct. With Kathleen Wynne, I think it was like 68% or something. So to see that actually below 50%, time for a change, 
that for an incumbent government, especially one that has its share of controversies and its share of, you know, a real public hits, uh, those are strong, strong numbers. So we really are seeing the NDP and Liberals trying to say, you know, okay, it's do or die time now. If we're going to stop Doug Ford and the Conservatives from getting back in or stop a majority at this point, it looks like, you know, the, at best they can hope for is to hold the Conservatives to a minority, even though they're talking about the Liberals being able. They can't. So it's them now, and they're, they're laying out platforms that are essentially identical. So now it's, in, it's a matter of if you're the progressive vote or an anti-Ford vote. And let's face it, with the lack of real issues during this campaign, other than affordability and housing prices, I mean, where, where no party is emerging as the clear leader or winner on this, the issue is Doug Ford and the Conservatives. Should Ford Nation be re-elected? That's what it's all about. And as it stands right now, most voters are willing to give them, it seems, that, that second term. So how do the NDP and Liberals differentiate themselves? Well, we've got one leader who's in her fourth campaign as leader of the New Democrats, and the Liberal leader in his very first one. So his goal is to, you know, beat the NDP and come in second. If he achieves that, that's a huge victory for him. He knows he can't become Premier at this point. The Liberals are coming from, unaf- you know, no party status. They want to c- recapture that. And again, the seat projections have them somehow, even though they, they seem to be gaining on the NDP in popular support, they're still seemingly below the NDP in the seat projections. So that appears to me to come out to a neck and neck sort of thing. We're going to have to wait and see what happens on June 2nd. And as John says, anything does happen. I firmly believe campaigns matter, especially these last nine days. They're going to be crucial. And we saw that with Ford today. He really spent as much of his time talking about you know the highways and, and the trends that he's going to build as knocking down Del Duca and the Liberals and what they had 15 years and didn't do, and knocking down the NDP and how bad they are. It was really a lot firmer in the targeted attacks, and I think we're going to see more of that in the next few weeks, or excuse me, the next nine days till we got the election. There's no few weeks left, is there? There's just the nine well, days. It, so I just think to, to sort of close it out here and, and go back to the whole rant on the storm, when I got back into the car to actually leave the area where we had been hit by the weather, Bob Dylan was on the radio playing uh, Shelter from the Storm. So it, I, I suspect that that's going to be kind of the feel to these uh, this final stretch as we head in the uh, the Tories really trying to shelter themselves from whatever storm might come and, and, uh, and survive well, it until the to second. To that end, to that thing about the storm, I, I want to go back to this thing on, on Holiday Monday of the Ford campaign putting out this notice to the media, a news release of the Ford campaign event, and when we phone up to say, well, the media aren't invited. Okay, uh, I guess. I've never seen a premier pull that or anyone running for re-election to pull that kind of thing before. But it's one thing, you know, it, 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 what it really makes clear is something we saw at the beginning of 2018 when the Ford was first running, you know, and they didn't put on a media bus. We were all kind of a bit sh- surprised by that. But it worked for them. And so this time they just went, you know what? To heck with the mainstream media. We're just going to go right over their heads. We're going to film our own videos. We're going to edit out any gaps. We're going to avoid all those nasty questions from reporters. And then we're going to put it all into Facebook ads that can be targeted specifically to voters' very concerns. Why would they care about the mainstream media? And that, I think, that just pointed it out. They truly don't care. And when he did get questions, again, Sean O'Shea is not some over-aggressive reporter coming in all guns blazing and why didn't you do this or that. He was very calm and respectful, and the premier treated him pretty much like dirt for just being there. I mean, the only thing I would say, and I'm on a podcast with two veteran, esteemed, uh, lauded reporters at the moment uh, who've done mainstream and now doing lots of other things. I don't think the media, you know, is is below having a personality complex about who they want to have versus the other people. I mean, I've seen it in editorials. I see it in terms of how media approach different people. Uh, I mean, they're human, right? Like this, this happens. And we were actually the company that I worked for, Angus Reed, many years ago, was actually owned by Southern News for a stretch of three years when I joined it, and then they sold it back. And so I come from the age of where Mar- Marty Goldfarb would say, "Hey, well, like those numbers, look at these ones." And we were the, they were the only polling in town, internal numbers as well. I haven't seen a blitzkrieg of bad reports and headlines about Ford. I haven't seen a whole above the fold banners about Del Duca to win or, you know, Horvath going down tubes. I don't see it. So much to your point, Keith, um, there may be some things that uh, conservatives are, you know, doing that in a, in a campaign with some kind of edge to it race, you would have those kind of things, you know, in a bubble, not answering questions, doing it. I don't catch the mainstream attitude in this one. And I think, you know, after a while, I, and again, as an observer, not a media guy, I look at this and say, 
the people who are reporting on the campaign have personalities too. They have biases in a sense. They're the close to these candidates. I don't dare ask you who you'd prefer of the three to be in power. But the reality is that each one of those people has to ask the same question of themselves. So I can't see them kind of going, well, Dale Duke could make a great premier today. I'm going to, you know, tilt stories that way or the same to Horvath. I just I think the, the 48 percent who say there's change, you know, is not the same as you said, uh, Dave. It's the 63 percent that threw him out last time. And that infects media, too. And I don't see it today at all. So are the conservatives getting a pass? Kind of. Yeah, they are. Mm-hmm. But isn't that the opposite? Isn't it the opposition's job, the opposition parties, rather than trying to beat each other up, to say, "Here's an area or two where we can really take on Ford." And I, again, I'm going to go back to it: the long-term care home deaths in the first wave of the pandemic. 4,400 people died, and this government was found to have completely ignored long-term care. The two opposition parties are both agreed in wanting to get the private sector out of long-term care, and yet they have failed to pile up on Ford at any opportunity to make this an issue. Why? So there is no issue, other, than, as I say, other than it's about Ford Nation getting yeah, reelected. Also- That's their fault. The media can't make an issue out of this. I know editorials can be written, but we're not talking editorials. We're talking media coverage, and I think... We can cover the opposition if they launch an effective campaign. They have not well, done so. Well, that may be true, and that's politics, right? You know, if a you, you know coulda woulda well, shoulda. it's also but, it's also lazy media. Well, well, can I just say this because to the point, to, yes. to, to, to Keith's point, you know, where are the 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 questions to Del Duca and and Horvath? Why is this not the burning issue up front? Where you guys have completely failed all of these people who have been left, you know, twisting in the wind. That's part of the job, too, and, and, and I don't see that either, John. Yeah, it, true, but th- the other thing about polling and being publicly released and transparent about these sort of things is you can actually go back through the entrails and find it on websites, right? So let me tell you this. During the course of the pandemic, when all of those people were dying and afterwards when they had recovered and there was still scrutiny on the government for all this, if I was polling through that time frame and I found two things. Number one, the approval rating for the government really didn't fall any below 37%. I mean, if you ask whether the province of Ontario was doing a good job or a bad job and doing all this sort of stuff, it was hovering around 40 to 43%. So you keep your eye on that gauge in the cockpit and you got to go, okay, things are going okay. And as long as you're in the, you know, you're, you, you feel terrible about people dying, but it's kind of like, all right, so you're in the majority range. So there you go. And that's a, but the polling I specifically released dealing with it, go back and look it up on, on the long-term care stuff found that the concentration of anger against the government was where? In Toronto and North Bay. That was it. Outside of that, people were going, hey, it's fine. I mean, go up to Renfrew County and ask my wife's cousin who runs the long-term care home up there how many deaths they had. They were, they were locked down from third day in, and they didn't have these problems. There's whole swaths of the entire province that did not have a problem with long-term care. But there sure as hell were in Toronto, and there were in a couple of pockets. And you, then you kind of separate it out. So I look at the numbers and kind of go, back in those days, they were getting approval ratings for how they were handling this in the majority seat zone that they need to be in constantly. And the second thing was, if you were outside of Toronto and outside of a couple of pockets, it was okay. And that's on the record. So... I, I get how we're concerned that all these people, you know, died and things like that. I don't think when you look at the polls today, when you actually specifically ask people whether you will hold people to account for their response to COVID, and that's an actual thing that you see in a number of these polls, the answer is, meh, it's behind us. You know, what the hell else could they do? Every other, I mean, yeah, you know what the response to that is? Thank God I wasn't living under Jason Kenney. I mean, that's kind of... Where You know what I mean? So yeah. it, it's now we're moving ahead. It's a long weekend. There's fireworks. There's like hot dogs. It's like get out and vote maybe next weekend. We'll see what happens. But I think they've already taken the long stare. I think we're past that now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think based on just anecdotally, uh, there was a fair amount of the the political conversation that you had predicted over the long weekend. So be curious to see how that uh, that reflects itself by the end of the week. John Wright, Keith Leslie, I'm Dave Trafford. This is the Writ Race. It's the daily version of On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast. And by the way, you can uh, find it at StoryStudioNetwork.com. dot <laughs> com.